Hey guys, Mike from Boyer Bows here. Alright, this is just going to be kind of a discussion on the Penobscot Gold. Let me pull it down from where it hangs. The Penobscot Bow that I did the other day. This is sort of the how-to. Uh, obviously not a build along. But, um... We're just going to talk about it because I don't think this really... I have plenty of videos on how to make a bow, how to tiller a bow, how to start a bow from beginning to end. There's really no new secrets here except for a few little details that go into the double bow. Uh, specifically, what you need to know is, if you're at least if you're going traditional, the ratio uh, between the short bow and the long bow, um, lengthwise, dimension-wise, um, how to accommodate for, uh, unless you have woodworking equipment or you're really good with a hand planer, um, how to, how I accommodate for a round bottom, round belly, um, short bow and a flat board bow, long bow, just, it doesn't matter what it is, it's just, how to get around not having to use a joiner, basically, or a planer. And um, anything else, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I will say this, the short bow is going to be a much heavier bow. It should be anyway. When I say much heavier, I really don't even know the poundage on this. I was able to tiller it, so it was bending, and it was bending pretty easily, but not... Uh, the bow jumped up and weighed afterward, um, so it definitely is. I mean, you can just you can see it's it's pretty. It's got some spring to it. It's not impossible to bend, but it's not nearly as. I mean, it's it's it doesn't have any kind of draw length to it. I think the draw length on it's probably about 10, 12 inches at the most, and. Um, this bow obviously is going to have a much more free, full uh, tiller. It's a normal bow. It doesn't need to be extra long. It doesn't need to be uh, in draw length. It doesn't need to be specific. You can actually uh, up and lower your draw weight by tightening or loosening this string between the bows. The string is a is a really t it's a tough thing to get on the bow. Um, it, it you know you can see that just the weight of the other string alone, it's not very tight. When I string it up, it goes taut. But while it's the the main bow is unstrung, it's 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 got a little bit of well. Here, let's flip it to the other side where the string. See, it's it's pretty loose, but it's still you know it's not completely slack. But of course, when this gets strung up, the bow is brought into brace height, and this does go taut. Uh, all right, so let's start off with where did I get the dimensions from? What are we looking for? So I'm going to bring the camera over to my computer screen here. Where I got this from, hopefully you're going to be able to see. Let me back up a little. This is the book, uh, Encyclopedia of Native American Bows, Arrows, and Quivers by Steve Alley and Jim, or Alley and Jim Ham. Volume 1, Northeast, Southeast, and Midwest. And within this book, they cover the bows of, here you can see it right here, the bows of the Penobscot tribe. Now this bow is actually different than the one I made. And I made it, there were three different bows that were crafted or, or demonstrated within the book. This one had a sort of a reflex deflex, almost a recurve bow, and the short bow, the one I made, we come over here, you can see the diagram was for a basic long bow, unstrung and strung ver versions. Um, and that's uh, just what I decided to go for here. You can do it either way. There was actually a Penobscot bow without the back bow as well. But um, this is the general way I looked at the bow and how I, I, I went about making it. Now, the important dimension, I'm going to see if I can blow this up here for you a little bit. This right here, let me blow that up, and see if we can, that's the length of the main bow, which is in this case 59 and a half inches, 
you can see it was 9 16 inch wide at the top. So it's actually, it's a little over half an inch. It's a little bit of a thick uh, diameter, thick width of that bow. Backing off, we're going to go to the short, or the back bow now, as they called it in this book. And let me get to it here. The back bow was 30 and a half inches. So you can see that the overall dimensions of the two bows were about a two to one ratio. I rounded for about a two to one ratio. If we were, you know, this is almost 60 inches, this is almost 30 inches, that would be one to two ratio if it were. Uh, actually, this uh, back bow is slightly above that, so if you went a little hair longer on the back bow, it'd be okay. Um, I have seen people make these bows with the back bow almost exactly the same length as the main bow, and they work very well. So, really, I just wouldn't go shorter than, than a 1 to 2 ratio. Anything in between is probably okay. Uh, the only difference I think would be that your your bow profile is going to increase dramatically, um, which may cause issues if you're walking around in the woods or something. You can see that the final product of this bow, uh, which is here, looks very similar to what I delivered on the video, which was by intention. Now, the um, cross section of the bow is here. Now they did a very much a, a, um, a rounded bow back in the day. Now you see how the back bow is a, uh, it, it overall makes an oval, which is kind of like an English longbow, um, with two very flat edges on it. It lashed it down with, I believe, rawhide. And uh, the tips, now I, I made a much more high profile bow my lower bow was a board bow, so it was actually more of a square. And my upper bow was a stave bow, so it was very low profile curve on the top, and then it had a big profile. It was almost this entire shape was just my back bow, which is why I had to do an accommodation when I put latched the two together. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go over the way the tips run. The back bow tip looks like this. It's very wide for a tip, and that is because the string is going to be coming off in a, at, a, at an unusual angle, I believe. It's a very strong tip, and the, the string actually catches on the inside of the, uh, the knock point like a normal bow would, except the string is going up instead of down. They This recurve one that's on the... Uh, cover of the book, the tip was actually strung backwards where it was it would come from the inside or the belly side of the bow out and then over the top of the knock and connect here. There's actually, it looked like a bit more of a superior system and I'm going to do that next time. I, I really like the way that sort of, it looks like it's going to really pull the bow back down in a better fashion than just having it strung this way because the stack on this would normally be tremendous but if you come this way the pulling it down just presses it down as well I like that setup very much the um, main bow tip is more of a typical bow you know what you'd see a pointed uh, tip mine are kind of square uh, I made the the but you know I can always change that it's very easy for me to change that later um, but that's, there you go, that's what the main tip looks like. And I just wanted to share with you, I, I was always under the impression that the reason for this design was because the bow wood that they had available in obviously the northeast was uh, just not great bow wood. I thought this was an accommodation to poor bow wood, but I read down here when they describe this bow that it's hickory. And we all know hickory is a tremendously good bow wood. So there must have been something else happening here that... Uh, oh, I should mention that all of the drawings in this book were the author... I believe Jim Ham was the illustrator 
he might have been the author, I, whoever the illustrator was, actually went to natural history museums where they all had authenticated the native tribe bow that they was on display and he got access to the bow and took his measurements and his dimensions and, and found out as much as he could from the archaeologists and the uh, curators about the bows and then brought these drawings to the book. That's why I use this book. It's very, it's as authentic as it can be. Um, and I'm surprised to hear that these were made, this was a hickory bow that he took his drawings from because hickory is so good, which completely sh shoots down the idea that um, for me anyway, that this was as a result of poor bow wood. There must have been some other reason um, for this. I, the string was a three-ply rawhide string. The handled joint was wrapped with fine rawhide. This is a bow design unique to this tribe, perhaps a first something step on the way to the modern compound bow. That's what I was referencing in the uh, statement. This is a perhaps... Um, on the way to becoming a compound bow. All right, so the only thing I can think of that's really left to talk about was how did I lash? I didn't put wood to wood. I did not use a planer. I did not use a joiner. I did not even try to sand the bows together. Uh, I just lashed them down. So what did I do to accommodate the two different shapes of wood? Um, I'm going to show you what I did. If you let me get into better light here. You can see there's a spacer in there. I'm trying to... There we go. Whoop! Get some sun. There it is. All right. What you see there are uh, three or four, I don't remember how many I use now, pieces of tooling leather. Okay? So obviously I cut the tooling leather to the shape of the handle that I wanted to accommodate. Then I glued those pieces down and with leather glue, which the, do I have my leather glue available? No, apparently I, oh, there. This is the leather glue I used. And um, leather, craft, leather craft glue from EchoFlow. I just, I just glued them up. Waited 24 hours for the glue to set, and then I submerged the glue in water so it became pliable like you would do to mold leather. Then I put the two bows together and clamped them down with C clamps. And what happened was it left, and I left it clamped for 24, between 24 and 48 hours so the leather was really dry by the time I separated them. What that did was it left an impression in the leather that snugly fit both bows so that when I went I then took the bows apart and did all the stuff I wanted to do on them but when I went to lash them back down they fit like a glove into the impressions that they had made in the leather from when I had soaked and clamped them so that's how I got these to fit so well together without needing to glue or having to I was concerned about shaving more wood off of this but the, of the top bow in order to make it fit into the uh, main bow. Uh, I thought the, it would get too thin if I flattened it out there. So that was my rationale. It also gave an extra separation between the bows, which I like. And it worked out beautifully, as you can see. All right, those are the little things, uh, the dimensions, the trick on the handle. Um, I can't think of anything else right now that uh, is really that different from making a regular bow. But if you have any other questions about how I did this, um, feel free to put it in the com ask the questions in the comments section or message me directly. Um, I'm more than happy to talk, happy to share any information I can get uh, or give. And uh, I hope you like the bow. I hope this helps. And uh, Go out there and make your own, guys. So, from there, that's Mike from Boyer Bows. Hopefully, this answered all your questions. Talk to you soon, Mike from Boyer Bows.